Kia ora and welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod once again. I'm Ross Carl. After a big weekend where we had the Crusaders win Super Rugby once again, joined of course by James Parsons in Auckland and a round of applause for our resident Crusader, <laughs> Brent Hall. Just five straight titles for Brent. Uh, Congratulations, mate. Have we got a tattoo sponsor yet for, <laughs> for the next show? No, we don't, mate. We don't. But um, no, what we did, what we did, there was a, got to be able to be a WWE wrestler, which I, at Japan, as I used to love WWE, and um, got given this this belt from one of our one of our sponsors, and um, it's going to a great cause. It's all signed by the boys, and um, it's going to go to a charity off that. But um, I'm a massive WWE fan, so been able to put that around for the whole night and uh, the last probably 24 hours it's been it's been a dream come true to be a WWE wrestler so that was good. <laughs> good on you mate <laughs> I, I take it there's no you know suplexes people aren't jumping off the high rope at, at trainings no they wouldn't we would have um no definitely not we're smart enough to uh to not have any WWE moves unfortunately so uh, no rock bottoms or um through six one nines or anything like that <laughs> 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 um, tell us about the celebrations it was a good solid 24 hours of fun yeah it was we had a few lemonades and, and oranges uh, orange juices which was nice but now it's really good we um spent a bit of time in, in the changing room with with family and friends and sponsors um, it's always great to be able to spend time with them and they got to come in and um you know have our team song um have some food have some drinks and then uh, we actually went to aikman's which is one of our sponsors frank who um looks after us really well and um, and then from there, we caught up with the team yesterday and um, had a had a nice get together, had some food and um, enjoyed each other's company. Uh, it was pretty pretty weird actually. Thinking you know, usually when you have those kind of celebrations, you think the season's done. But you know, for us, it's uh, been able to really enjoy what we've done. It's it's a tough competition. We've talked about it a lot this year with how tough this competition is. And, and now for us, it's been able to refocus and recharge, get back to zero. And then you know, we've got the Trans Tasman with the Brumbies this week at home, which uh, is going to be a big one for us to come on the weekend. Wow, so you're back on the bike. You're literally back on the bike on a Monday morning and back into it. Yeah, we did. We went into a um, into QE2 and jumped on a spin, the spin bikes for us as a, as a group. And then, you know, a couple of us got into that sauna, which was um, always good to get out a bit of sweat um, from the weekend. So, no, nah, it's going to be all good. No, and you, a, Brenna, a nice you probably went and did a conditioning session or an MAS session or a running session. He's a fitness freak. <laughs> doing something silly like that. No, I was a little bit so I was a little bit slow this, uh, this morning, but um, fortunately I've got a three three liter bottle right next to me, so it's been going down quite nicely after the sauna uh, this afternoon. <laughs> Tell us about that final, mate. You know, obviously with 20 minutes to go, you guys were down to 13 men. The Chiefs had some solid territory at that point and appeared to be on their way back into it. What was it like at that point? What was the messaging that was out there? Because this is probably a position that you guys hadn't been in in the final. Yeah, ideally we didn't want to get ourselves into the position where um, discipline's costing us, and you know, you know, Cody was pretty lucky, you know, to get a yellow card. Could have gone either way in a final, and you don't really want to be in a situation like that. And then uh, Sevu, you know, got um got sent off for that, obviously that high tackle. And so I think for us it was just it was we're actually real calm around it. The right messages we've been said, and um, you know, you kind of have those what if moments talking it before game and um, having scenarios in games at trainings to. Um, to try and best prepare yourself. You know, again, we didn't want to know. We didn't know that we we're going to have play with 13 men in a pretty crucial part in the final. But you know, we had um, some pretty good preparation around what that looked like. And you know, guys like um, Scott Barrett, Sam Whitelock, Richie, um, and Davey really brought the team together and um, you know made it real clear for us around what our next task was. And you know, and especially in finals, you know, you want to win as many moments as you can. But you know, it's winning the next moment. And um, you know, for us, it was just trying to be present in that moment. And you know, I thought Richie pretty much in that period of play was world class and really took the yeah just took the game over and I think the biggest probably the momentum shift was when he kept he caught that ball um, the Chiefs did a contestable he evades that person um, when he's coming into him and then um, we end up getting a penalty sorry a drop ball off that which kind of just got us back into the game which he with um, those two sin bins. yeah I agree with you I thought I thought that was a crucial period almost during those yellow cards uh, you guys came to light and probably played some of your better footy. Um, you know, obviously quite a high turnover rate um, for your guys' standards that night. And that that moment where he caught the high ball, evaded, he he went inside to you. Was there a guy in between for you not to be able to give that pass back? Yeah, when I got when David gave me the pass, I was going going through, and Brad Weber was at looking at he was at Richie, and then. The cover defence was coming just towards me. It had obviously had Brandon had uh, Brandon Inland inside me, but 
just feel like I couldn't get there and then actually tried to draw and Weber, but he actually did a really good good job just holding off and um, and the last thing I really wanted didn't want to do was kind of knock on and force that with an offload and then um, we would have loved to have a try in that scenario, but I think, you know, getting the advantage off that and uh, getting some form of points, which we probably didn't get a lot in that kind of passage play, didn't have a lot of momentum and um, to be able to, I guess, kickstart with that drop goal and then um, we went from there. But I think the rain the rain came in at the right time for us as well. Um, that probably first 15 minutes, it was really dry. There's a bit of wind around, so there's no dew, which you, know, you probably you probably think is going to happen at this time of year in Christchurch. And then that rain came in, you know, for us, kind of just tightened things up. Um, we kicked the ball a lot in that last 20 minutes. Not probably a few contestables, but we actually kicked long and wanted the Chiefs to run it back. You know, our kick to run ratio dropped right off, I think, at the start of the game. We wanted to be played probably five, six phases and then would kick after that. Uh, but in that kind of passage of play with a bit of rain and that um, back end of the game, it actually went to two rucks. We'd only play two rucks and then we'd kick the ball long and, and the Chiefs would try and hold on to it. And we were fortunate enough to get a few breakdown penalties and Richie um, slotted a few goals from that. Yeah, and I think the best example of that, how my, how you kicked a lot more in that last 20 was Will Jordan and how he kicked long. Yeah. You, know, you saw him early yeah. in the game, he was just looking to run back hard. Everything, you know, those first 10 metres was run hard and trying to make up as much grass, whereas towards that last 20, he was sort of cantering, looking for where the space was and always kicked long. And maybe some yep. are contestables, but mainly kicked long most of the time. I think his instinct's always to run first, and you could see there was definitely a change of tactic, especially during that yellow card, which is just smart play. It's just to play yeah. the territory better, on, and, and it worked out well. And it was the crucial thing Clayton McMillan even alluded to. It was a period of play where the Crusaders won, that period of play and the Chiefs couldn't get the points that they probably needed um, because I, I think the Chiefs had enough opportunities to, to win that final mm. but the Crusaders won the big moments when they were down to 13 men. Were you surprised by the way that the Chiefs approached that time especially when they were up by two men and after that their tactical approach to the game during the wet weather when they had that period where it seemed like it was theirs for the taking and they just didn't take it? Well, I think their tactical approach was right. You know, they went for the points. Unfortunately, they missed a few kicks. So they tactically went to go build some scoreboard pressure or get closer. And then when they went to attack, um, you know, they just couldn't get across the line. Um, so it wasn't really a tactical thing. It just was an execution thing on the night. So, so you would have gone for the kick, not the line out when you're up by a couple of men. Well, if you look at it, if, if you look at the where it, where it went to, um, you know, what, three missed kicks... You know that would have that, that would have put a lot of scoreboard pressure on, I, th I think, and um, could have been a different story. Um, but it, it, I mean, it's tough. It's hindsight. I, I think I think they had their tactics, and we'd spoken of, of their tactics previously, um, and that they wanted to build that scoreboard pressure and then try and put those points on. Um, and and that's that's what they they wanted to go with, and unfortunately they just didn't get the kicks on the night, and that and that led to that I suppose reverse pressure a little bit, and then they felt like they were chasing the game a little. Do you think that they were also maybe a little bit flummoxed by the Crusaders line out giving them some troubles? Well, I, I think the line out was always the way they selected their team. I think we knew it was always going to give them some troubles. Which surprised me why they went to full lineouts a lot. Um, you know, maybe I was I was probably expecting you know maybe three man, four man. I don't know about you, Bryn, or maybe a few more trick lineout plays, or maybe Brad Weber at the front and hitting him and um, passing it and uh, to to a forward at half or some sort of mixed up um, play. But because it all seemed a little bit too easy for Sam Whitelock there at the front, he was moving with them and moving around so um, and I know they went over the back but it wasn't clean ball you know they, um, it was Nankville or McKenzie um, over right over the back of the line out but I think you guys were ready for that Bryn you seem to always be rushed yep. Cody I know he got one horribly wrong but other than that they were really rushing to get into that zone and, and attack that channel so um, I, I just thought there might have been a bit more variation with how many Lucy's they'd picked in and around that line out. So was it a mistake, maybe, Bryn, do you think, to not have Akoi in there from the very start, considering the work that he had done through the year in their lineup? Oh, yeah, you, you can say that. I think, you know, hindsight's a great thing. I think, 
um, you know, Akwe has played really well through the year, but Mitch Brown, you know, job for them and um, seems to be kind of a guy that they trust and um, he's played a lot of a lot of a lot of games for them. So, uh, but I think coming back to your point, Jip, around um, you know them going over the top, they did a lot against us last time, and you know for us they actually got a lot of a lot of gains out of that and took probably their pressure off with their set piece. And so with Sammy and Scooter and those boys doing really well and putting them under pressure, um, you know, with the not being clean ball. And then them having to go to those kind of scenarios where they have to go over the top, we were ready for it because we'd seen it last time. And that's the beauty of being able to play New Zealand teams um, a couple of times through the year. But around that variety as well, I think, you know, when they did have a bit of variety, they had that 12-man line-out um, drive. And yes, they didn't score off it um, with the line-out drive, but what it did do, it tightened us up. And then um, Triple T ended up going open. And then, you know, Nankville has a, um, an unbelievable offload to Damo, gets a score in the corner. So... Um, they could have gone into variety. We did see a lot through the year um, that they did have a lot of four, five men and coming back on a, on a switch play to try and come back to a passive defense. But um, I guess for us, it's great work from Tommy Ellison, our defense coach, who, who did a lot, a lot of work for us, been able to have give us a lot of pictures around what the Chiefs have been doing because um, they've had a lot of success this year with those going over the top against us, um, switch players, and, and a, even that bit of variety with the twelve man drive as well. I see that uh, the odds are out, and the Chiefs are only at. Eight dollars almost for winning Super Rugby Trans Tasman. Is that reflective of, of their performance on the weekend, or should they be considered maybe higher up than that? Yeah, I, I hadn't looked at it. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think to judge it off one game would be a bit rough. Um, maybe it's a reflection of how good the men down south are, yeah. um, and and how clinical they are, and. and and where they're heading, I'm not too sure how, how what algorithm they use to work that out. <laughs> uh, I'm sure the TAB aren't keen on giving money away. So, yeah. um, but I, I don't think I don't think it's a big big factor going forward. They'll 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 find their way. Like I'm just the momentum in games that they'd won previously up to that, they'd got certain kicks that swayed momentum and lifted them. On the weekend, they missed certain kicks that were. Um, I suppose momentum suckers mm. rather than momentum lifters, if that makes sense. And and it was just a it was just a, a role reversal. Like like statistically, in the second half, they had 65% possession, 66% territory. You know the Crusaders turned over the ball 18 times to their 12. You know 14 penalties, two yellow cards to their 10. Like they they had enough there to win that game. And, and um, you know again. The Crusaders, you know, found a way to win with 13. It was almost like, I hate to say it, they looked better with 13. Mm. It, it, when when they got down to 13, it was like Moanga, um, you know, took charge of the team and, and the leaders, like Bryn said, you know, came together and was like, they simplified their game plan, they had a clear strategy and they executed it and they, they scored points when there were men, crucial points, like the drop goal, crucial. They got another the penalty, and and they were just calculated in that period of time, and I and I referenced Clayton McMillan before saying that that was a crucial that was the, those were the big minutes, yeah. and and that's when the Crusaders' big players stepped up and, and and they delivered. Does it ever cease to surprise you, Bryn, that you see that kind of clarity and composure in massive moments like that, especially from Moonga? I mean, you might as well call the last twenty minutes of every big game Moonga time. Like he just. It, it, it seems like such a hard position to be in, but something that you guys just handled so well. Yeah, I think preparation is a, a big part of that. Um, you know, when you're when you're clear around what your game plan is, and um, you train that through the week or throughout the duration of the competition, the confidence with that. And so, um, you know, the best thing for us is that you know every team does it, but as clear if you can be as clear as you can, um, you can be real decisive on the field, especially in big games. That's that's what you need. You don't want to be indecisive where. Um, that kind of thinking comes into your head, and then that's when you make mistakes. But I think a big, a big positive for us is that we have had experiences being in finals and understanding what that looks like for us. And look, um, if you would have told us before the game, we had two yellow cards, had fourteen penalties, um, had probably lost a lot of ball as well. It wouldn't have been the ideal um, final for us. But um, having an understanding of what the game looks like and what in that moment you're, you're needed as a player. Um, and especially in the last 20 minutes, you know, Richie took it for himself and I even look at David Harvilli as well. He led the tackle count for us and was, was massive for us defensively and, um, and even Lester Fionuku who's played, hasn't played a lot of centre professional rugby, but, you know, he's getting more rhythm and had some really good momentum um, carries for us to get in behind the Chiefs and the Chiefs um, defensive line. And so, 
Um, but yeah, Richie, mate, he was he's world class, and he we've talked about a lot on this podcast around you know, in big moments. He wants to be the the focal point in that, and, and look, he's done it again. He's done it for the last three, four finals we've had. He's been a guy that's really dragged us home, and um, you know, when you've got a player of that caliber who does that time and time again, it gives us as players such confidence when you've got a guy that can do that in big games time and time again. Let's talk about Leicester because Caleb Clark is going to the sevens. The official release today. Him and Aten and Nanai are going to the sevens. We've talked a lot about having a power winger on the left wing. Is Leicester Fying Anuku now a legit chance to play on the left wing for the All Blacks as a power winger? Because there aren't that many out there. Oh, well, I think he has to be. He's he's now an option because I think we all know that uh, squad members that can play multiple positions become more attractive, and he's now showing that. He, he can fit into a mid, midfield, and I think even if those guys are uh, in and around as well, like he'd be pushing for a case, like he's performed well. Um, so, so I think he'd be knocking on Selection's door, but I think, I think the Crusaders have looked pretty good um, since George Bridges come back, like their kicking game. Like, yeah. I, I, I think Richie looks a little bit more confident. Like, the first time I saw him crossfield kick the other night, he yep. didn't. He didn't just get the bounce, but you know George Bridges back, and he in that that triple threat game of his comes back. He could cross field kicks, and um, you know so he he might not be the power winger, but you know and then Sevu's playing some of his best footy again. There, there's just so many good wingers in and around um, as well, uh, you know around the country that that warrant to be spoken about. Uh, it's just it's going to be one tough All Black squad to pick, but. You know, for Leicester, he's done everything possible. He will have to continue it on, and maybe he might have to get a few more runs on the wing mm. to to push his case. Because if he, if he remains in the midfield, he might not be able to um, stake his claim. Yeah, because it's congested there. Um, but I, I suppose at the start of the season, were you expecting Leicester firing Anuku and David Havili to be well, the starting midfield for the Crusaders? Not the Sunday? starting midfield, so but. I think my old mate was pretty keen for him to be in the, the bolt of 15, so I have yeah. to credit him. He did have a crack at me. He did have a crack <laughs> at me that he wasn't in, in the bolt of 15, so he must have, you must have been aware of his, his quality. Yeah, he has made, like, you know, he's done a lot of um, good things at Tasman on the wing and um, has even been in with us the last couple of years around um, when he has had his opportunities, especially last year. He's played really well for us, and I think uh, having his ability, everybody knows that he can play winger, and yep. He'd probably want to play a bit more there, but you know we've had Jack Goodhue who's been out, who's been massive for us, and you know, for a kid that hasn't played a lot of centre um, at this kind of level in big games like that, um, he's playing tremendously well. So, but I think that just comes back to the guys around him and making him feel comfortable. You know, David uh, Billy's um, been great around him, around his game management and helping him out, and then having George Bridge back, who does a lot of stuff off the ball that not a lot of people see. Yes, he's great in the air, and you do see that on TV, but you know his communication skills, his work off the ball to be able to put players in, in great space on attack or even in defensively as well. I think probably the last fortnight we've wanted to put a bit more line speed pressure on teams, and George has been massive around that with his communication, communication, communication skills and being there in the right position. Uh, but I think for the All Blacks, we talk around the selection issues and... I think with Lathista, he's a, he's a winger, but being able to play this kind of footy as a centre, it puts him in that kind of um, utility role where he could be selected because he can play both positions as well. And gain line. I mean, it's hard to replace gain line. You look at almost every top team, they've got a midfielder who's got gain line ability. I know that Nani Lamapi's around, but you, it's hard to fabricate a guy who can hit the line like that. Yeah. Yep. I mean, Nani's probably the best at it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he hit the other night when he hits it, it it's, it's tough to stop. And, and I think it's, you know, I suppose if you look at the try that creates it, it's that big, strong carry and then a good ball out the back, quick hands from Richie and a grubber and a good chase. It, it all starts from getting in behind mm. from that good, strong carry from Leicester. So you're right, it, it's, it's a big factor. And even if you know it's coming, it's still hard to stop. Um, and the other the other aspect of it is he's pretty good at stopping other players that are good at getting gain line. Mm. Like defensively, he's not afraid of putting his body in front and driving some other big boys backwards. Well, let's go from there then into uh, awards for Super Rugby Aotearoa. Let's is he in for the most improved player of the year? Yeah, I yeah, I had him. He was my he was my most improved. But I also had um, Hamino. Oh, sorry, Kazuki Hamino. 
as well, who I think has been fantastic for um, for the Highlanders. And then some other, um, who else did I have for most improved? I also had, you know, Fanao Whakatawa, who didn't play a lot. He didn't play a lot because of his injury, but he's been he's been great with his growth. And then I actually had Flanders in, and Stephen Perifeta as well. I thought was pretty good for the Blues, who hasn't had a lot of had a lot of game time due to injury. So, um, but yeah, I had yeah definitely had Lister in that in that department. I, I nailed mine down to two. Um, I couldn't couldn't decipher, but l- it's hard to say most improved because both these players are awesome any, already at the start of the season. But for where they are now, I think they are the most improved in the comp. And first is Dave Havili. I think you know for where he's taken his game in the midfield. Didn't really, obviously, necessarily want to be there because he wants to play at 15, but he's now world-class, 12. Mm. And I think that is a hell of an improvement for where he probably saw himself and where others saw him. Um, You know, Bryn will probably correct me if I'm wrong there, but I I, I think he's now a genuine 12 option um, at international level and is a dead set for the All Black squad. And Dalton Papali'i, I think he's, he's... brought his game to a whole new level at super rugby level and he's going to get an opportunity to do the same at, at, at international level and I'm really excited to see him get some decent minutes at, at all black level. It's, it's phenomenal that a guy like David Harvili can improve considering where he's been at for the last couple of years. Yeah well I think it's just the positional shift. Yeah. You know that, that, that 15 to 12, I mean that grubber the other night, um, defensively that read on Weber that was just a rush read like that's just a out and out you know f- proactive forward thinking read uh, Samasoni comes off and he just rushes and holds them up it's such a crucial moment to get a turnover there where they're under pressure after Jonah Lowe's just gone short uh, you know th- it's those little efforts you know defensive leader uh, yeah, that's that's not something that you normally would expect from a fullback sort of you know Talent, you know, they're great defensively at communicating and putting people in the right spot, but to advance into the front line and then pull off a big play like that and, and you know, individually do it, you know, those are just two examples of a, a great performance the other night. Yeah, we need a trophy for this stuff. Maybe we give away these microphones. Well, we can't have a trophy for that one because yeah. we just named about 10 about players. 10 blokes. So. Okay, so <laughs> can we nail it down to one? Can you guys agree on, on one guy above all else? Uh, I think uh, probably David because he's moved positions. Yeah, are you in on that? Uh, yeah, David, I'll drop on it. Um, yeah. David, if we could afford to give you one of the microphones, <laughs> we would, but uh, we'll work on it for next time. Most improved. Um, could he also win all the rest of the awards? That's, uh, he's not going to win Rookie of the Year. Uh, who do you see as Rookie of the Year? I've got Connor Garden Bishop. I think mm. um, for, for coming from where he was at um, Bunnings NPC, um, sort of unknown to his performance where he pretty much fought his way, you know, I put him in my little bolt of 15 out of that preseason, but for what he did for the Highlanders, I thought he was exceptional. And he just bullied his way into that team, and then that form just continued until he got injured, unfortunately. And, and for me, he was he was outstanding and, and someone that is a genuine rookie of the year. Yeah, I had a couple. I had, um, I had Connor Garden Bishop. I thought he was um, outstanding before his injury, and then. Also, Luke Campbell from the from the Hurricanes. I thought he was um, he did really well for the Hurricanes, considering that it's his first year playing for the Hurricanes. And him and Tamatini at the start of the year went back and forth with starts, but um, but I think with him, he ended up winning that race and I um, mean, you know, played really well and um, did read the real um, core skills really well. His passing, his kicking game, especially contest balls, was was really strong for them and was um, pretty big in their exit strategy with the Hurricanes. But I actually had Kazuki Hamino was actually my uh, rookie of the year, he was outstanding coming in from from Japan. Came in a little bit ba- uh, late in the piece, but you know with his performances with Shannon Frizzell, who I thought was was great for the Hollanders in their one two punch with those two, and Billy Harmon as well played really really well um, as well. But um, for me, it was yeah, it was uh, Kazuki Hamino. He so was he, my most improved. He's most he's, he's, rookie. he's most improved, and he's rookie. Are, are you trying to get a gig in Japan? <laughs> <laughs> are you off contract or something? Mate, he's mate, he's just been um, he's just he's caught my eye, mate. Love him. Caught nah, my eye. He and has, just, uh, he has been know. outstanding. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. <laughs> just winding you up there. Uh, talk Next to minute, if you say Tony Brown's the best coach, coach yeah. I'm out. Oh, I'm telling you, <laughs> you, you, you are definitely yeah. looking for a Japanese gig. Yeah, that's right. And if, if Jamie Joseph is also <laughs> in the, in the yeah, yeah. Group, then it's obvious what's going mm. on here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good call, though, because if you think about 
three, four months ago, we were talking about the return of Liam Squire. Uh, the, the name Kazuki Himeno, uh, most of us probably didn't even know he was turning up. And three or four months later, it's as if Liam Squire never came or went. He is huge in Japan, though, in Japanese yeah. rugby. He's, he's got a pretty strong name. And I think that's why he wanted to come down here and test himself. And he's certainly proven that he's, he's got quality that can perform all around the world. Yeah. Um, so he, he'll go back with a lot of confidence for international rugby. Yeah, I wonder if he'll return. I'd say he would. He looks pretty happy here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if you were the Highlanders, you'd be banking on him coming back at some point, right? You don't unearth a talent like that um, to Super Rugby and, and not go back to them. No, that's it. He look, look, looks like he's enjoying his time. And, um, you know, like Jip said, he's, he's a big, he's a well known name in, in Japan. And he probably wanted to come to New Zealand and test himself. And he's tested himself, but in saying that he's, he's added, he's added to the, uh, to the name of his brand. And, to people coming from Japan, um, playing rugby in Japan, wanting to test themselves in, in our game. It's um, it's great to see for not only the Highlanders and himself, but you know, Japanese rugby as well, being able to have a caliber that player come in, play so well, um, and then you know hopefully you know, that adds to him being in New Zealand a little bit more longer. Uh, let's move on to the next award. Um, I'd love to know what happens to you if you don't name Scott Robertson as coach of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going Tony Brown, aren't I? So, <laughs> yeah. Good idea, mate. Um, uh, no, like, yeah, look, if you're winning five titles, um, you know, raises, you know, he'll be, he's there or thereabouts. And look, you know, he's coached us really well. And especially with um, with how, you know, we had a few, lo- few losses through there, but we came back and won the title. But, you know, you can't, I actually had Clayton McMillan. He was my he was my choice with the thing, with how the Chiefs went last year and um, to put them in a, in a position where they were in the final on the weekend and, you know, things, um, a few things went his way in that game with penalties and getting the points that they deserved. Um, you know, they probably could have been, you know, champions as well. So I just think the growth that um, they've had and um, such a proud, a proud club, and um, it's just really brought that team back with, um, you know, the, you know, bar the, the loss in the final, um, had five games in a row and were the form team in the comp. So um, I would go Tony Brown, but um, you know, raises honourable <laughs> mention to Clayton McMillan. Yeah, he'd be my coach of the year. Tony Brown can be international coach of the year, mate. Yeah, that's it, mate. It'll pay dividends in three years' time. Yeah, yeah. But he wants it now, mate. He wants it, he wants it gig now. Um, oh, look, I, I agree. I think Clayton McMillan deserves uh, acknowledgement. Um, I think he's done a fantastic job. And, and you know, and Neil Barnes, Nick White, uh, Roger Randall, they, the whole collective unit played a big part of putting themselves in a position and put the Crusaders under enough posi- uh, pressure to be able to win the game, the final the other night, but they couldn't get the job done. Um, but I, I've gone with Razor purely because of the, the, the two losses and um, I think that was the most testing time of his coaching career because you know he's had a lot of success at under 20s with Canterbury, then the Crusaders, you know, he isn't he hasn't felt a lot of, you know, I suppose, losing pressure. And uh, he, he kept upbeat, you know, he kept his same personality, he didn't change. You know, sometimes you think, you know, win, lose or draw, you know, how are they going to react? And he, he reacted with a smile, with the same energy mm-hmm. and, um, you know, didn't, there was no panic and, and eventually got them to the title again. And I think five titles in a row, um, and, and I think he, he made a comment Afterwards, he goes, you know, we might not be liked, but I know we're respected. And I think, you know, that's 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 what drives him. You know, is he is is that respect part? And he's he's certainly um, he's certainly got my respect, and the Crusaders have certainly got my respect because five titles in a row is is a hell of an effort. I thought that was an interesting comment because I kind of feel that like people don't actually dislike the Crusaders that much. They just respect them. I mean, it's there's some <laughs> jovial banter, but. Really? I mean, D- Brenda, you feel, I mean, you should know, when you go other places, do you feel like opposition fans actively dislike you or do they just want to beat you because you're good? Yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's expectation. You know, I think every time we play a team, especially in this competition, um, you know, there's an added, there's an added pressure for us because, you know, we want to, we want to win and teams bring, bring the A game every single time they play us. So, you know, it almost is a final every time you play um, a New Zealand team and, um, especially with the fixtures, with how tough they are, and you know we, we know each other pretty well, um, it makes it that much tougher. So, um, but yeah, Ray's 
you know, I can see where he's coming from because, um, you know, teams, teams want to beat us. Teams I want th- to beat us and you, you're competitors. I think I think a lot of people around the country have admiration. Yeah. More than no one, no one hates you. But I, I think I think it's what motivates you guys and maybe him. The Chiefs use it as underdogs as well a little bit. And, you know, you go back to that Michael Jordan documentary, sometimes you create little things in your own head to motivate yourself. Yeah. So it doesn't doesn't really matter um, how they do it. But at the end of the day, he's coach of the year for me because five titles. I mean, yeah. wow. Yeah, I'm and, and let's be honest, you guys got an opportunity to go six is this that, year. Is that how you see it, though? Do you see it as an add-on to the current title or do you see it as an entirely new title, seeing as you don't play a complete It's an entirely run? new title. Yeah, but you don't play all of yeah. the other teams. You're going to have to play a final. Yeah. They've just played all yeah. the other teams <laughs> yeah. and won it. They won it. But then you could throw it all away with a couple of losses in this, and then all of the games before that don't count. Well, they count. Yeah. They count. Yeah. Uh, I, I, well, I, think, I, think, I think for us, I think for us it's, yeah, it's definitely a new, it's a new competition, and any time there's a final, um, you know, it, it, it adds to it. So we're definitely um, – we didn't look too far ahead. We, we obviously had our final on the weekend, and uh, we wanted to concentrate on the Super Rugby Arturo, but – this is a new competition. It's an exciting new experience. We're playing against you know Australian teams, and both um, both countries are involved. So even though we don't play the New Zealand teams, um, well, possibly we could. Who knows? There's a final, so it's just the top two who have the most points. So it could be or it could be an Australian final as well. So um, we definitely do see it as a new competition, and it's um, it's going to be a sprint. You know, it's going to be a sprint because you know you don't have a lot of a um, lot of room. Not a lot of error, sorry. It's not a lot of room to um, to get it wrong because it's a sprint pretty similar to Mighty 10 Cup. So you want to start off strong and then um, you can start making um, decisions around how at the back end of the tournament what that might look like for us for finals so and how you, how you get into it. It's the two naughty boys going head-to-head this week. Five yellow cards between you two <laughs> in the final. <laughs> yeah, well, we're not, yeah. Look, we can't afford to do that again. No. Well, maybe we do because you said we played so well in the last 20 minutes. So yeah. I don't know. Well, can... neither, neither can they. Just... They gave three. Yeah. <laughs> they think they're playing in yeah. the NRL. Yeah. <laughs> Straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Brumbies first up. I mean, that's a great way for you guys mm. to start because the, le- the legacy and the history between those two teams against each other, home and away, in multiple finals... You know, and having not played yeah. each other for a while, that's a great way to start this competition for you guys, especially considering the way that those two finals panned out really late for settling the games. Yeah, well, it's discipline that cost it for the Brumbies in the end. I mean, 21 penalties to eight in the end, three yellow yeah. cards, and they had control of the game for the most part, even though the discipline allowed the Reds into their half and they played a lot of rugby, they took the three points on offer for the most part, but never really ahead. Um, And probably Brumby should have won it, but the the Reds scored an 85th minute try through James O'Connor. But I I don't know, I think the Brumbies would probably rather it was in their backyard than them having to go to Christchurch. I don't think they've got the best record at Christchurch. Well, none of us really do. Um, So so it'll be a a tough first up challenge for them, um, especially coming off off a you know, a tough, tough final loss um, against against the Reds, but no doubt they probably didn't do too much celebra- celebrating, and they would have <laughs> they would have sharpened their eye focus straight onto the Crusaders. Mm. Does it make for a fun review, considering you're playing an Aussie team and it's completely different? Yeah, I think it brings a level of excitement. I think it's been well documented, probably from a lot of New Zealand players, that um, you know the health of scale to crash and bash just isn't sustainable. So. Um, you know, every single game you play, it's it's always a tough encounter, and you know, there's been a lot of injuries throughout the year due to that um, due to that style of rugby. But um, Australia teams bring something completely different. Um, they play a different type of rugby. We've talked around that. They have a, li- a few little differences compared to New Zealand teams, and also the refing as well. There's different refs as well, which will um, which will add to the occasion. So you've got to be adaptable around what that might look like and um, going into games. But you know, I think last time we actually played the Brumbies, they ended up coming to Christchurch, and I remember that game, that first 40 minutes. They were right on top of us. They came in with a pretty dominant set piece, wanting a line-out drive, which has been um, traditionally really good for them. Um, they've given us a lot of problems around that, and you know, their, their breakdown um, was pretty great, pretty good in that first 40. So um, you know, that was a couple of years ago, and so um, they've improved. 40, yeah, it yeah, is. Um, and we, we, we played them. Yeah. Yeah, we did play them in the afternoon, which added to that. So, 
Um, we might be, you know, we're playing. We're playing at seven o'clock. Is that I right? Think so, seven yeah. o'clock. Yeah, so it'll be yeah, somewhere yeah, so, the other night. Yeah, and I think it's going to be a, be a bit colder as well during the back end of the week. So, um, yeah. But I think their set pace is, is, a, is a real dominant force for them. Chip, you're yeah, probably they'll go, they'll go, their they'll go back to their, their line-out drives. Um, yep. uh, they'll be pretty direct. They've, they've, uh, the, uh, Lola Sio, they, they run some good decoys. You know, he has got mm. a... Uh, they, they run out the back, a few rap plays, banks. If they can get their platform going, they are a quality outfit. We, we know that. Um, it will be the battle of the forward packs that will decide it. What do you guys make of this Gatlin squad? We've got Sinclair, Sexton, and maybe Ringrose are the ones who people are complaining about. Uh, are they on the money with leaving these three blokes out? Oh, Sinclair, I, I think he's a point of difference. Yeah. I like his skill set. Yeah. I, always, I always reference him to the Charlie Farmawina type, you know? Like, he, he, he's just got something different. He offers something different, so... I haven't watched enough of him play at the moment to know what form he's in and the reasons why, but um, I was surprised to see him missing. Um, I think Jonathan Davies as well, you know, with the yeah. form of yeah. form of Wales um, and yeah. just the relationship yeah. as well. I just thought, and that midfield, you know, like if you look, um, I don't know, just the midfield, there's a lot of, there's a lot of new blood in there, Bundy Aki, Chris Harris. I just thought, Maybe not the spinner, Chris Harris, <laughs> <laughs> um, with the form of Wales. I thought he'd be in. But um, the other one, Josh Navidi for me as well. He was awesome yeah. during the Six Nations. Yeah. But I know that Lucy, uh, you know, because I also think Sam Underhill and Billy Vunapola, you know, those are two big names as well. And then you've got, obviously, Sam Simmons, who hasn't, you know, mm. we've been hearing cries for him to play for England, but hasn't. And now he's got British and Irish Lions gig. So yeah. that's a hell of a uplift and you know so and Hamish Watson who's your boy you wanted yeah. him in there so <laughs> those boys are probably missed out to those guys um, and then maybe Johnny May as well you know I know form wise maybe not but like you know he's been around and, and done the business for a long time but I think all those young guys that we spoke about mm. they're all in there um, you know uh, Van der Merv, uh, Adams and uh, Reece Samet yeah so yeah but Finn Russell's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think everyone saw the Sexton thing coming because there, were, there was too much talent around. But I suppose it doesn't change the fact that you've got a guy who's an incredibly senior bloke and a team that's achieved a lot over the last few years, suddenly not in the Lions. I think Bigger just played so well during the Six Nations as well. And then Owen Farrell's ability to go from 12 to 10. I think it's just a squad thing. Yeah. You know, they're not having to carry three tens. I think if they carried three tens, then maybe he slips in there. And I think that's probably where Davies doesn't fit in and neither does George Ford is because of Farrell's ability to go between a few positions. Yeah, any time you can, you know, a guy like Johnny Sexton of his calibre must stay in the squad. Um, and I think obviously injuries has probably played a massive part around that. But um, yeah, I think with the form of Dan Bigger in that Six Nations, um, you know, he's probably warranted of selection. And Warren, Warren Gatlin knows him pretty well as well in the past. And um, Finn Russell, we've talked about it previously when we've had um, talked around Six Nations. Um, his form in, for Scotland was was great. So, um, but you know, I look at uh, Bundy Aki. I think you know some people might think it'd be be a bit surprising, but I look at when Ben Teo was selected for the last Lions tour. Just bought something a little bit different, and I think Bundy's a little bit different. Look, Jonathan Davies has been a proven performer at Lions level and at um, at Welsh level. But um, you know, I look at you know Ben Teo when he played against us um, at the Crusaders, he was massive around ball carrying, getting over the advantage line, and um, especially with this day and age of um, line speed pressure and um, big men like um, the South Africans, you know, he might just have a point of difference around um, having that kind of physicality. But then he's also got great subtle touches that he's grown. In the past three, four years as well. Yeah, and I think because they couldn't, they didn't pick Manu Tuolangi. They needed a yeah. style of player like that, and yeah. I think Bundy Aki yeah. fits that power ball carrying midfielder with the subtle touches as well. Because he's not just mm. that either. Mm. You know, he does have a he does have a lot to his game. So I, I think he warrants selection. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, I think he's more in that twelve spot. Um, yep. um, you know, and then whether they go for Farrell there or not, but yeah, I, the other selection I really like is is Gareth Davies, and I was actually surprised it was his first time being picked. Mm. Um, the Welsh mm -hmm. nine, 
Um, I mean, you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll know more about him or like more about him, but I thought he was great during the Six Nations, you know, just around, I don't know if uh, Wayne Pivak brought it out of him or whatever, but just around his quick taps and those little, um, you know, catching teams off guard and playing a little bit of tempo. Yeah. He just seems to um, be in some great form. Um, and I thought it was good reward for someone that's been around a while. And I think maybe Warren was the first to pick him in Wales. So uh, first to pick him in Lions is, I don't know, cool story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> X Factor yeah. is great yeah, too. I think, I, think on, I think on that as well, like, um, you know, Connor Murray's proven, you know, he'd probably, he'll probably start. And then, you know, you talk around the impact off the bench around um, what other players can bring in. That up-tempo style jip, which could be crucial in, Especially like South Africa, you look at the other side, you've got Fifth Clerk, then you've got which is Yanchis, you know, Yanchis who does a similar play for the South Africans. So, you know, that ability to have that 23 man squad and uh, being able to have up tempo, especially in the belt, if it's good weather conditions, a guy like uh, Davis, he uh, fits right into that mould of being able to bring up tempo about back into the game. Yeah, it just opens up sometimes on the high belt, doesn't it? And then anything can yep. happen. Can mm. if you're sucking in the big ones. <laughs> Well, they will be. They will be. Both oh, teams. Yeah. Both teams. Yeah, that first one, jeez. It just hits you. So, so does this squad, <sighs> does it affect the way that you predict what's going to happen in this series? Or are you pretty much in the same place about, about how this is going to pan out? The South Africans are so unknown. So it's hard. It's, it's yeah. just hard. Mm. Um, it's certainly, it's an exciting squad and I'm excited to see the series. But we'll just know a hell of a lot more after um, the first game and... And it's, yeah, I, I, I do like how much I think they've gone for a lot of form. And, and, and that, that's, I feel, the best case scenario for what they're going into. They're, they're just backing their coaching skill to get a group together, but a lot of current form as well. And in a setup like the Lions, where you often hear about factions and things like that, and who's being selected and who's not. Taking a whole bunch of guys who uh, undoubtedly in form will help Warren Gatland, you would have thought, Bryn, in making this team come together because they all know that that guy next to them is there based on nothing other than the fact that he should be there. Yeah, well, that's it. And I think um, the biggest positive they have is that Warren's done it. He's done it before. You know, with this is his what, fourth tour? Maybe his, was his fourth tour as coach? Oh, he did Aussie, Four? New Zealand. Did he do South Africa before that? Uh, yes, I think he did. Yeah, yeah, so this yeah, did, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so this is a small tour. So you know, for a guy that's got a pretty good understanding around bringing groups together, um, and you, I looked at that documentary when they came in for the um, for the New Zealand squad around you know Andy Farrow's messaging around you know well they want the British and Irish Lions to be the top team in the competition. So you know when you've got that kind of mindset and um, and hunger and that's driven throughout the group through the leaders and the players, um, you know it's going to be pretty pretty special for that group and um, again there's a lot of guys that have been based on um, their form in the competition which probably sometimes if seen in the past with the media they um, they probably go to the tried and true but you know Warren's done a great job around you know, bringing a lot of form players from different different nations as well you know look at the Scot, Scot, the Scottish con contingents in that squad um, so now it's going to be exciting and it's, it's the unknown for the South Africans as well you know they haven't played since the Rugby World Cup so um, it's going to be interesting and you know, it's just unfortunate that there'll be no crowds because I think you know having the um, the Red Army over there and then how proud supporters the South Africans are. Um, other than that, um, it's going to be a great series to watch. Yeah, how big a factor is that going to be? Like, I've got a really strong memory of sitting in the cake tin for that second game um, against the All Blacks and being completely drowned out by the sound going around the cake tin. Any time New Zealand tried to chance or did anything, it was completely drowned out and it was very obvious who the home team was. It was the Lions and it wasn't the All Blacks. You know, that's, yeah. how does that pan out? Well, I think it will be a different experience, especially for the 18 new caps that have grown up wanting to be British and Irish Lions player and experience exactly what you're talking about. Um, but they're there to do a job and, and they'll be focused on that. So um, it, it'll be different. But they'll be well aware, and I'm, I'd be assuming they'll be putting things in place already to, to prepare them for it. You wouldn't have the same extreme highs, would you, in an empty stadium? No, no the I can't imagine, they, so it'd be weird. It would be really strange. It'd be very strange. And especially if you were to especially win Especially for a game this big. Yeah, and, and let's say yeah. a historic series, and you win it. Like, I mean, this is, this is like up there with World Cup sort of big, you know, 
these British and Irish mm. Lions tests. So, um, I think yeah. I think one positive probably um, the Six Nation boys have is that they've actually experienced that and have a pretty good understanding of what that feels like in a test match. Mm. Um, yeah, probably the South Africans have played you know at Super Rugby level and Curry Cup around around that, but even though um, they haven't played, the British and Irish Lions haven't played together, they've played in scenarios where they haven't played in, in front of people. So having that experience and being able to um, do that in South Africa, it won't be that foreign to them. And um, yeah, it is different. It's a, yeah, we did it for Mighty Ten Cup and that was obviously not on the scale of what it is for a, a Lions tour, but it is different. It's different. The, 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 the momentum shifts that you can get through a home crowd or people that are in stadiums, it definitely has an influence on you as a player. So um, it's going to be a lot more internal and within the group and the leaders in, in, in the game uh, because you're not going to get those momentum flows and the kind of um, euphoria that you get um, playing in front of people. Now, the Wallabies in France will play in front of people, but mm. they've got to play mm. three tests in 11 days. It's like playing at a World Cup, but without having the minnow in the middle that you've got to play against. Yeah, but it's the same for both sides. And the one thing I love about, as a player, I loved when we had Storm Week during... Um, Bunnings NPC was that less training is more games. I don't know why, but every player loved it because you just, it was literally you'd play, you'd recover, you'd review, preview, you know, train, you know, no contact really, well, definitely not for the backs, but there's a bit for the forwards. Um, and then your captains run and then you're back into it, and, you know, and almost you played your best footy during that week because you just didn't have time to think mm. or overthink mm. as a group and you're just into it. It was, it was amazing. Some, you watch teams that were in, um, you know, because sometimes you were the team that was in storm week but the teams you were playing weren't, if you know what I mean, and you were the, you were the team that was expected to be under, you know, tired or fatigue and you would actually be peaking. Yeah. It was really weird. Yeah. They should have done a study yeah. on it. Yeah. It was, yeah, it's always that um, the first two games you always end up being, it's the second game where people would think, you know, it's a short turnaround. That game was all good. It's the, it's the third game. It's the third game in that back end of the, that week where nah. you really have to, uh, <laughs> what's it oh, We look at Harbour. We look nah. at Harbour. We had that experience at Harbour, mate. You know, it fought too well, mate. Nah. We, that's what happened at we just scraped through past Waikato. It was a good good yeah. last-minute penalty um, kick. <laughs> but I think, I think what's going to be massive is probably the coaching. Because I know you think about in the media when we used to have storm weeks, it was, it was a nightmare for coaches because, you know, you, as a coach, you want that four-week preparation to get your players to look at the right thing. So I think the coaching aspect around who can do that best and um, Front get the right... Front-loaded as well, eh? Like, you almost have yeah. to cut the clips and have it ready the next morning, eh? Like, and you just... Like, it will have to be... Especially at that level, mm. it'll yeah. have to be, like, the night of the test... It'll have to be a sleepless night for analysts and yeah. D coaches, and it'll be uh, it'll be a hectic eleven days. And squad depth, I reckon, Bryn. Well, you're yep. going you're going to have to give guys opportunity. Mm. So, do you pre-select almost as much as you can, barring injury? You know your sides, and and take it like you would a, a tour where you got guys know that they're going to appear in week two no. more than likely, or whatever. Well, you don't do that. I don't reckon because. It's tough because, you know, if you lose that first test match, you can't afford to rest players, no. you know. Yeah. You've got to be able to come in that second test. But then, you know, that third test, if, and that's, it's, a, it's a decider, you know, that the Australians could have had the opportunity, you know, we might rest the, like a couple of players for that second game knowing that they've got the third for the opportunity to, to win the series. But yeah. I think it's going to be a sprint, man. It's going to be a sprint. So um, the coaching side, I think, being able to get that right, for their players, you know, they might end up um, having a bit of a leaner menu. You know, you might not have, you might not take as much in because, you know, players might not, um, you know, get their prep where it's a little bit harder when you've got more information on, on short weeks. So, all those kind of um, talks and uh, understandings around what what's needed um, to try and win this test series. And there can be tactics as well, like around you know how how you feel the team's going. You know, you can kick a little bit more, maybe kick less. You can feel that they might be a little bit more fatigued because they've had to defend a little bit more and then you'd hold on to it and make them tackle even more. Mm. You know, there's there's ways that you can feel for how Test 1 goes to how you prepare for Test 2 and Test 3. Um, there'll be all sorts of strategies that you can take in such short turnarounds Yeah. Um, because of that fatigue factor. It sounds like good fun. 
Oh, yeah. And great <laughs> viewing. Yeah, yeah. And especially with the French. Because with the French, I, suppose, I mean, this is a, a complete stereotype, but you feel like a three-test series like this for France could be absolute glory or complete mayhem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's why you love the French. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think they're, they're, they're coming down here with a lot of expectation. Like, you know, we'd almost expect them to, you know, be carving, really, from what we've seen. Yeah. I know that they didn't win Six Nations and, and they probably put themselves in a position to do so, but they slipped off towards the end. And that, you know, we've said in the past that it's about their growth towards 23 and that those sort of games slipping off are about them learning lessons to be better towards 20, 23. Well, now it's about making sure that they have learnt them and then they're coming down here to, to show it off almost, mm. or at least show that there's progression or maturity, um, that it isn't up and down, that there is some consistency across these three tests and maybe the short turnarounds will be good for them. You know, there isn't True. these weeks yeah. to go like that. It might just be perfect, it might yeah. be a perfect fit for them. Play what you know, play on instinct. And go. just go, yeah. don't overthink it and yeah. just let's just play footy. It could be it could be seriously dangerous. <laughs> they could just yeah. be even more lethal. I wonder if the the riffing situation is going to go to jump. If they're going to have neutral riffs, or they've got to be able to adapt to an Australian riffing official team. It's a good question because I think you know, they they do go um, they do riff things a little bit differently. Both styles, you know, Australian riffs are a little bit different to Northern Hemisphere riffs. So yeah. I think a team best adapt to that. Like we've talked about a jump us going over to um, Australia and being able to adapt to that, and so. I think it's going to be the same for the French, whether they have Australian refs or, um, you know, ends up being a, a neutral, neutral setup. 